I would like to welcome everyone here to our Thought Leadership Series tonight, uh, featuring Alina Marks. My name is Mike Daniel, and I'm the Program Committee Chair. Uh, my official role on the Jones Partners is to find speakers such as uh, Ms. Marks to come and provide their insights um, as what's going on in their current arena, which is healthcare, which we're all concerned about. I also want to take a moment to recognize our corporate partners, um, the one who makes these events possible. Uh, if any of you are interested um, in becoming a corporate, a corporate partner of Jones Partners, there are several members of the corporate membership committee uh, in the audience tonight. Uh, I'm quite sure if you can seek out one of those people, um, they will gladly talk to you about the benefits of joining Jones Partners. Uh, as well as if you want to become an individual member, you can join as well. Um, we have a really busy spring. We have three additional th thought leadership series. Uh, coming up in February would be uh, Lee Boothby, uh, the chairman of Newfield Exploration. We will have a roundtable series uh, in March uh, with Professor Caldra. We also will have um, Laura and John Arnold, co-chairs of the Laura and John Arnold Foundation speaking uh, at the end of March. Um, as well as um, Thomas Bacon, who's the founding partner of the Limestone Group and is currently chairman of the Houston Parks Board. Um, given the recent events of this past fall, um, he should be giving us his, his take on the recent floods, as well as his view for greening of Houston over the next uh, five to 10 year time frame. Uh, so at this time, I'm gonna introduce uh, the Dean, Peter. He's gonna come in and introduce Alina. Thanks, Mike. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Rice University and the Jones Graduate School of Business. This evening, we have a fantastic speaker for you. I can always say that, and this time, uh, I really feel honest uh, and true about it. My favorite thing <laughs> about coming to Rice is being in a city where we have the ability to convene some fantastic uh, leaders in key parts of the economy, in key parts of our lives that make a big difference. And there's very little uh, place I can point to that makes a more difference uh, than the people who keep us alive and healthy. <laughs> Tonight's talk about health, not just healthcare, uh, will give something to everyone. And uh, I'm gonna do my best to get out of the way quickly and turn it over to our esteemed speaker this evening. Uh, I'm gonna read a little bit about uh, Elena Marks. I just wanna say she, she's also the parent of uh, a 2017 graduate of the Jones School of Business and uh, all of these uh, lesser accomplishments uh, are, are also valuable, but I wanted to note that uh, going forward and as well as our other affiliation. Elena M. Marks is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Episcopal Health Foundation. The Episcopal Health Foundation, for those of you who don't know it, works to improve the health and well-being of 10 million people in the Episcopal Diocese of Texas, which covers 57 counties in East Texas, um, 57 counties in East, Southeast, and Central Texas, including Austin, Houston, Beaumont, Lufkin, Tyler, Waco, and Bryan College Station. Uh, Elena is also a non-resident fellow uh, uh, in health policy at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy, just across Jamail Plaza here behind me, where her work focuses on access for low-income and uninsured populations. She serves on the boards of Grant Makers in Health, the largest national organization serving the field of health philanthropy and community health choice, a nonprofit community health insurance organization with over 300,000 members in 20 Southeast Texas counties. Ms. Marks holds a bachelor's degree from Emory University, a law degree from the University of Texas School of Law, and a master's in public health from the University of Texas School of Public Health. Ms. Marks', is, Ms. Marks is previous professional experience includes serving as the Director of Health and Environmental Policy for the City of Houston, consulting in the health, healthcare industry with large systems and community-based providers, starting and directing a successful legal placement firm, and practicing trial and appellate law with major Texas law firms. Please join me in offering a very warm Rice University welcome to Ms. Elena Marks. Thanks very much. 
Thanks very much. Um, I don't know what it means when you get up to talk about health and you learn that there's an ambulance outside and nobody can get in. Uh, that's probably not on my agenda tonight, but interesting. Uh, so what, what I'm going to do tonight is um, first tell you a little bit about myself and why I do what I do and how I think about it. And then I want to talk to you about whether or not we're getting value for all of the trillions of dollars that we spend in health. And I want to talk you through a series of slides that'll show you where the money is coming from, where the money is going to, and what the causes are that actually contribute to positive health outcomes. And I hope by the time we're finished, you'll have a different way of thinking about what we're doing in this country with our very large investment in health. Uh, so about me. I started life as a lawyer professionally. Um, apparently, I did wear that little bow tie uh, because there's a picture. I have no memory of it. Uh, and I practiced law. Uh, this is uh, Mayor Day and Caldwell, which was a Houston firm that merged into Andrews and Kurth probably 10 years ago. And um, so I started my life not anywhere near the health field, but as a business lawyer. Uh, Time went on, I got married, my husband is buried somewhere in this room, alive, but back in the back of this room. Um, and then I had three kids, including the one who graduated from the Jones School last year, uh, and another one of them who's actually in the room. And so um, my life went through a lot of different kinds of changes, being a lawyer, becoming a mom, starting a business, becoming a mom for the second time, stopping work, uh, becoming a mom for the third time and staying home with kids for a while and spending some of the time that I was home with kids as a volunteer lawyer for healthcare entities that were serving low income and uninsured populations. And um, that was really my first introduction to anything having to do with health other than stuff that concerned me or my family personally. And while I was home and um, mostly being a mom, but also being a volunteer and really learning about the system. Um, I had a housekeeper, and her name is Claudia, and we are still friends today, and she hasn't worked for me in probably 20 years now. Um, but Claudia's life story was really different than mine. She came over from Mexico as a 16-year-old by herself uh, for a better life, and she was an extremely hardworking person and a perfectionist and um, pretty OCD about the way she kept things in the house and the way I was supposed to keep things in the house. She tried so hard at everything she did. She took incredible pride in her work and in herself. She ended up, after a number of years, becoming a bookkeeper and actually is the office manager in a medium-sized business today. But the time I spent with Claudia just brought home to me how privileged my life had always been um, compared to hers and how hard she worked and how smart she was and how deserving she was of the very best things in life. And by an accident of birth, I had the opportunity to attain those things much more easily than she did. And that stuck with me and it, it put in me um, a, a passion for social justice. And while I've ended up playing it out in the health field, I could have done it in some other field as well. But I became very interested in why it is, by an accident of birth, people have completely different lives. And it, I just don't think it's fair. Um, and so as I was uh, really getting kind of bored staying at home with the kids, sorry, Andy, who's out there, um, I, I was ready to go back and do something again. I didn't know what. I really didn't want to practice law again. Uh, and I had a friend who was on the faculty at the School of Public Health. And she said, well, you've been doing this health stuff. Why don't you uh, go get an MPH? And I thought, OK, um, I'll go get an MPH. Um, I, I didn't know what public health was. I really thought that public health was about using public dollars to pay for health care for people. And of course, public health is a much bigger, broader way of viewing the health of entire populations as opposed to medicine, which is devoted to providing health care services to one person at a time. 
And when I went to the School of Public Health, you know, you have to say why you want to get an MPH, why are you interested in this program? And what I said was I was interested in who gets health care, who pays for it, and who decides. And those are the questions I'm still interested in. But as you'll hear tonight, I don't think of it in terms of health care anymore. I think of it in terms of health. And this is when I began making this transition that I've been able to come full circle on in the job I have today. Uh, so fast forward a little bit more, I had the great privilege of working for Bill White when he was the mayor of Houston. And uh, basically, he had the same questions I did about fairness and who gets health care, who pays for it, and who decides. And the city uh, has a large public health department. It doesn't do a whole lot in health care delivery, but he and I cooked up this job where I could essentially use his bully pulpit to spread the word and do whatever we could to increase access to care. Because at that point, I was still thinking that if you can get people into health care, then they will be healthy. Um, I'd come a little bit farther along because I was focused on keeping them out of hospitals and emergency rooms and in primary care settings in their communities as the best way to do that. And while I was at the city, I got to do a lot of really interesting and fun things. Um, for example, we had uh, underutilized space in city facilities, and I brought in other health care providers and essentially bartered space with them. I'm looking at Dr. Maddox here. The Riverside Dialysis Center is something that I brought into a city building uh, for the Harris County Hospital District brought some of the federally qualified um, health centers into other of our buildings. Um, I also got to develop a pay or play program. The city contracts with tons and tons of contractors and puts out billions of dollars a year in contracts. And some of those contractors um, were not paying for health benefits for their employees. And when they didn't, the employees were uninsured. They were winding up either in the emergency room or in some of the um, uh, community clinics. And somebody pays those bills. It doesn't just evaporate into the ether. And so what we did at the city was put a policy in place that said that contractors had to demonstrate either that they were providing a certain level of health benefits by a commitment of dollars, or they had to pay into a fund that we collected. And the city still has going and raised, at the time we were raising about a million dollars a year, and then we used that to make grants to the organizations that were providing that uh, uncompensated care. Um, I also got to write the city's smoking ban, which was an actual public health accomplishment and um, a really interesting piece of work. The best thing I got to do at the city, um, and probably my best professional experience, was during Katrina, which is horrible to say for anybody who went through Katrina, but for um, me and for many others who got to serve during Katrina, it was a life-changing event. Um, I'm looking at Dr. Maddox again. So the, the city um, uh, hosted people um, at the George R. Brown Convention Center. And the, most of the people from New Orleans had already come into town. They'd populated the Astrodome. And um, the one morning, the mayor decides we're opening the George R. Brown because the Astrodome is full up and there's still people coming. We're sitting at a senior staff meeting at 7 in the morning, and he says, and you have Hall A. It's 130,000 square feet. Put health care in there. I thought, OK. Um, and I did, not personally. I'm very resourceful, and I know a lot of people, and made the right calls to the right people. By 11 o'clock that night, we were seeing patients, and we saw t more than 10,000 patients over a four-week period, and um, they got some of the best care that you could get anywhere in the world. And it was a life-changing experience for me um, because it was a window into seeing what you could do if you really wanted to do it really quickly, um, not necessarily following all the rules, but also a window onto what people's lives were like before they got there and what their lives were gonna be like when they left. And while we gave them excellent care, they went back into circumstances that weren't excellent and were not going to improve their health. Well, fast forward again, um, I uh, finished at the city and then I went across the street that way, I guess, to the Baker Institute and was doing health policy work. Really happy doing that, not looking for a job. 
Um, but I got this incredible opportunity with the Episcopal Health Foundation. Um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about it. It was created on paper in 2013. The Episcopal Church of Texas owned the St. Luke's um, Episcopal Health System. And they had made the decision to uh, sell the hospital system. And they closed that transaction in uh, May of 2013. And the hospital system then belonged to Catholic Health Initiatives. In exchange for that, the church got a billion two hundred and sixty million dollars. They put it into a new entity that they called the Episcopal Health Foundation, and I got hired to run it, which is an absolute miracle. Um, the um, chair of the board is the bishop of the diocese, and he is this young, progressive visionary whose idea was if you really want to improve the health of the people who live in these 57 counties, how would we go about doing that today? And is having an acute care hospital system the best way to do that? And suddenly, we had all of this money, and he said, how do you think we figure this out? How do you think we can best serve people in the communities they live in so that they can be healthy? Uh, with a billion two sixty, and um, it's having been on the other side of looking for money for most of my career, it was a real um, uh, change and honor and privilege to get to be in a position where you actually have the resources to help poor people. And um, I often tell people I'm in the poor people business. It's where I want to be uh, because I want to address the fairness. It's not fair that where you were born determines whether or not you're going to have a healthy life. We can do something about that. Uh, so I want to talk about health and health care. Um, and I want to talk about the vision of health as being something much broader than health care. And I think that we have an issue in this country where we've conflated the two. So I want to talk about them one at a time. So what is health care? Uh, this is Grey's Anatomy. Uh, a lot of people get their ideas about health care from watching TV. We see incredible stuff going on. Um, on TV all the time, and that's what we think that, that health and health care are about. Um, we also know that it has to do with needles and doctors and ambulances right out front, and um, pills. It's high-tech, it's invasive, it's urgent, and it's really important, and it's really inexpensive. But what about health? So I would suggest that health is something really different. Um, at the Episcopal Health Foundation, we use the World Health Organization's definition of health, and the definition says something like it's a, a state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of disease and illness. And so if you think about health as a holistic concept, that means that a person is able to live a life productively so that their mind and body are not holding them back, then you look at what it is that leads to health in a really different way. So I want to talk about how we're spending our money. And I want to talk about a typical situation that many of us may have gone through uh, having to do with back pain. So let's talk about falling down the rabbit hole. Who here has had back pain? Most people, but not everybody. Um, so if you've had back pain, you know, you get up and it hurts, or you make the turn and it hurts, and what do you do? So you're supposed to call your primary care doctor, right? We've hopefully gotten everybody in the habit of having a regular physician and calling that physician. So you go there, and he says, well, I don't know, it could be a lot of things. Uh, why don't we start with some x-rays? X-rays are pretty cheap. They're not invasive. Uh, let's have an x-ray. Well, probably it's not going to show anything. Uh, well, let's up the ante a little bit. How about an MRI or a CT scan? Surely there's something else that's bigger and more expensive that we can do to try to figure out what's going on with you. Um, who knows how much an MRI costs? Shout out some numbers. What is an MRI? Yeah, so everybody here is right. 
Um, it costs whatever somebody charges you and can get away with having you pay. Um, and what the actual cost of it is, I'm not sure anybody really knows, but it's um, a lot less than what the um, going rate generally is. So after you've had the MRI, it probably isn't showing anything more anyway. You're confused, you're still in pain, um, you just don't know what to do. Somewhere along the line, you've been on Google because there's always something there. Somebody there has an amazing remedy for you. Maybe um, Dr. Oz has something. Maybe Oprah has a new regimen for back pain. What a lot of people end up doing is some stretching, some exercises, work with a personal trainer, um, and more often than not, that and something like ibuprofen and time is actually the solution. But this is what we like. Uh, all of these things. Who doesn't love a Da Vinci robot? So let me tell you the story or remind you of the story of Million Dollar Murray. Did anyone read this? This was in the New Yorker. It was a Malcolm Gladwell piece in 2006. And it was called something like hot spotting. Today we call them super utilizers or high cost, high need patients. But Murray was a man who lived in Reno and he was homeless, he was alcoholic, he had a lot of different issues, and he was bouncing in and out of jails and hospitals and jails and hospitals, and that happened continuously, and they called him Million Dollar Murray because over less than a 10-year time period, he had accrued more than a million dollars in healthcare expenditures, and he was still like he is. Um, he eventually died. So aren't there better ways to deal with somebody like Murray? You could put them up in the Zaza. We ran the numbers. You actually could. They, they were spending $150,000 a year on his uh, ineffective care. Um, you could hire a personal attendant for him to sort of monitor him and, and keep him out of trouble. Uh, you could give him an apartment. Then he wouldn't be homeless. Uh, you could feed him. You could make sure he had transportation. You could connect him to basic social services. You could do all of this, probably not the Zaza part, um, together and reduce the costs of caring for him on the system and improve his quality of life. Um, so we ask, or I ask in healthcare, are we managing problems or are we solving problems? Are there some problems that we turn to the healthcare system for that they simply can't solve? And it's not because they're not good or trying really hard, it's because um, Health care is a fantastic tool, but it's just one tool. So this is a picture of a woman named Dolores Somerville. This comes out of an article that was in the Washington Post last month. And the story they tell is about her nine-year-old son, not the one she's carrying, who has really bad asthma. They live in Baltimore. They bounce back and forth between um, Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland hospitals. Johns Hopkins actually has a world-class asthma center there, and the kid goes in and out of the hospital and in and out of the ER, and he's got all sorts of meds, and it happens over and over again. And what they talk about in the article is the reason that he is having these asthma exacerbations is because he lives in a house that's full of mold um, and that has a lot of chemicals in it, and I see in the picture his mom's smoking, so if that's going on in the house, then... Um, it's no wonder that he's doing that. And the article makes the point that says that the hospitals just keep on treating him and keep on billing Medicaid for it because that's what they're paid to do. So I want to know why we're not delivering more health um, because it seems like we could be with $3.2 trillion in the budget. Um, so I'm going to take you through a little exercise. Bear with me. I'll move through it quickly because I really want to talk about how you can do this differently and better. Uh, so which of these statements is true, or how many of them? One, all of them, a couple of them? So they're all true. Um, and the reason that some of them don't seem true is because of cognitive bias. And there are lots of different forms of cognitive bias. Um, so, for example, um, one 
kind of, of uh, cognitive bias is called um, the availability heuristic. So when you ask the question, who has a more dangerous job, a police officer or a fisherman, we are often bombarded with pictures of police officers who have died in the line of duty, and it's awful and it should never happen, but it actually doesn't happen at nearly the rate that fishermen die. We just don't hear about that, and so if you see all the time on TV and in the news that um, police officers are dying, then you would think that being a police officer is a much more dangerous job than something like a fisherman because we don't hear about that. Um, then sometimes we get emotional. We um, uh, take one idea and we just cling to it. And this is a chart that shows you roughly um, the, the way um, people think about um, uh, the safety of cars and planes. People are completely freaked out about planes and they um, are nervous flyers and uh, on a per capita basis, people die in car wrecks much, much, much more frequently. And a, a bizarre unintended consequence of, of our being emotionally attached to thinking that planes are more dangerous um, it can be told through an airline that has a policy that children have to be in a car seat because that would make them very safe. And when that policy went in place, people quit flying because then you had to buy an extra car seat and instead they were driving. And so they were actually putting people at greater risk by having them drive than if they let them just actually run around free in the plane. But this is something that we cling to. Um, there's also confirmation bias. We all like to um, feel that we're right, and so we look for things that make us um, confirm what we already believe. We see that going on um, in politics, particularly today with all the polarization where people only look at news that supports what they already thought. Uh, and lastly, there's a negativity bias because um, people take in negative information or big information and they overrate it, and they give it more credibility than other data. Um, and it's, a, it's um, an evolutionary thing. We needed to know when we were um, worried about tigers eating us where the last place was that happened so that we wouldn't do it again. And we transfer that same kind of thinking into the way we think about health and health care. So we think about these incredible surgeries or somebody's back was repaired through this incredible um, mechanism that was very expensive. And that's the lens through which we see health. And we don't remember that most of the time people get well on their own and that the things that they need to be healthy are not necessarily found in that surgery but the surgery is what sticks with us, and so we really want it. We want it badly. And that, this is why we think of a hospital when we think of health. People always say health care. They almost never say health. Um, so we're spending $3.3 trillion as of 2016. It's over 18% of GDP. So we're spending all of that money. Um, shouldn't we be, like, incredibly healthy in this country? Uh, a few more questions for you. Um, you you um, know where I'm going with this. How many of these statements are true? None, none, none. They all ought to be. I mean, we think we've got, we, we always talk about we have the best medical care in the world. Um, we have the biggest medical center in the country right here. Um, all of this ought to be true if we are spending this kind of money. But none of those are true. Uh, and so I want to talk about why that might be. Um, if you think about health as uh, an equation that consists of the quality of life and the quantity of life, you want people to live long enough and you want them to live um, uh, feeling good enough to be productive, take care of their families, and take care of themselves, um, this would be a formula. So this chart here comes from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and, and there uh, are decades of research now that looks at what are the factors that contribute to health. And this is one depiction of it. There are others. Um, I'm going to walk you. Well, now I'm going to just stick to this slide, and then I'm going to jump on, so I'll move on. Um, so if you want to know what's going to contribute to a long life and to high quality of life, these are the factors, and this is the contribution that each of those makes to uh, a long and a high-quality life. 
So the biggest factors are social and economic factors. It shouldn't surprise anyone, um, but it often does. Next, health behaviors. If you are not eating well and you are um, uh, smoking, you're not going to have as long a life or as high quality a life. Uh, physical environment, if you're living in a dirty environment, you will suffer because of it. And then clinical care, so that's 20%. I have seen uh, reports that put this at below 20%. I've never seen anyone put it even at 25%. And so this chart shows where we're spending our national health expenditures. The $3.3 trillion that we spent, 18% of GDP in 2016, this is where it went. Um, the biggest chunk of it, 98%, went toward clinical care, things that are involved in providing health care to patients. Uh, and that correlates with the 20% causation. The little bottom red uh, bar represents the public health investment, 2%. And yet public health certainly encompasses health behaviors. It also touches the environment and some of the social factors. And so... We are spending all of this money on something that only contributes 20% to health outcomes. And this is what we get for that. This is my favorite slide in life. Those of you who've heard me do it before, bear with me. Uh, and I'll talk you through it. So this is data put together by Elizabeth Bradley uh, from the Yale School of Public Health. She's now the president of Vassar College. And she has been studying um, international uh, health indicators for years. And what this chart shows is each of these columns is one country among the OECD countries. The light blue bottom part of each bar is the percentage of GDP that that country spends on health care. The top dark blue part of the bar is what um, each country spends on social care or social spending, what we would call in um, our vernacular the social determinants of health. The green line running through shows you the life expectancy in each of those countries. And so when I look at this graph, what I see is that we spend the most by a lot on health care. We spend the least on social care, and our life expectancy is at the bottom. If I ran the line across for infant mortality, you'd see the same thing, we're the worst. If I ran it across for obesity, these same countries, we're the worst. If we ran it across for people age 65 and older with chronic conditions, same thing. And I would submit to you that it's not just the dollar amounts, but it's the ratio. The investment in something other than medical care yields better health outcomes and we are not making that kind of investment. There are countries whose uh, life expectancy are substantially higher and their total spending is lower, and there is good reason to believe that the investment in non-medical care is making a bigger difference in people's lives in terms of quality and quantity of life than just putting more money into medical care. And it doesn't have to be this way. Um, we're hung up on our perceptions that putting in more medicine is better. If one MRI is good, two MRIs might be better. Um, if proton therapy is available, it's got to be better because it's newer and it's more expensive. And that comes crashing into the reality of what it takes to make a person healthy. So back to the same equation, health is quantity plus quality of life. Health is the end game. Health care is just a pathway. It's just a tool to get people healthy. There is no inherent value in health care except to the extent it makes you healthier. But, of course, we're spending our money on health care, right? This is what we love, especially the da Vinci. Who doesn't love the da Vinci robots? Uh, and yet this is health. This is really what we want. So let's look at a value equation and the relationship between quality and cost. Uh, you can use this formula in anything. Here I am in the business school, so <laughs> it, it, it's good to have, okay, thumbs up. Um, what we want is to get value. You want your quality and your cost to match. And 
we want that in consumer products. We want that when we're buying a home. We want that when we're on a vacation. But in health, we're not getting our value. And is that okay? I don't think so. Um, so I would say our value today, making up this number for purposes of this conversation, that, we're, that the quality we're getting is a five compared to a cost of 10. Um, and that's not very good. And there aren't a lot of other sectors that get away with this for as long as we've gotten away with it. And it's not going to always be that way. Um, what's holding us back here, though, is that we are emotionally invested in healthcare as a solution without looking beyond whether or not healthcare actually is enough of a solution to get us where we want to go. I'm not the only person thinking of this, of course. Um, and disruption is occurring. We, um, last week we heard about, or maybe it was this week, hospitals starting to manufacture their own drugs because um, pharmaceuticals are so expensive. A drugstore, CVS, is buying a health insurance company. So there's disruption going on. But that disruption is really about the cost side. What these things are trying to do is bring down the dollars. Um, so if we start with five over 10, there are a couple of options for us. We can bring the cost down to five. We could bring the quality up to 10. Um, the default in this country is, well, let's cut the cost. And that's a good thing. We have a lot of waste. We have a lot of overuse. We have high prices. Uh, you probably thought that's what I was going to be talking about tonight, but I'm not. There's good work going on in that area, and it needs to keep going on. But here's where I want to end up. I think that we can get to a place where we decrease the cost and we increase the quality if you measure it by health outcomes instead of just by medical expenses and the quality of a medical intervention. And I know that because we're doing some work at the Episcopal Health Foundation in this direction. Um, you get what you pay for, and we need to change the incentives in our system so that those who have the health care or health dollars are actually delivering health. So what would it look like if the health care industry were responsible for health? If we said we were paying you for the health of a person, not for delivering medical services. So here's some things that we've been involved in. So if you remember the Washington Post story about the woman whose son has asthma, um, this is Angel. He lives in Houston, and he lived in an apartment that had all of these asthma triggers in it. And he kept coming to a clinic that is one of our funded organizations, and they would um, you know, give him medicines, treat him best they could. He'd go to the ER occasionally. Well, the clinic came to us and said, can you support us to, do, to visit his home and fix what's going on in his house? And we said yes, and so we did that. And so uh, Angel got uh, new mattresses, some other new materials in the house. It didn't cost very much. It was a, maybe a couple of thousand dollars, and it improves his health. Um, we uh, are working with some insurance companies who are interested in doing this kind of work. Ultimately, because most of these kids are on Medicaid, we'd like to see the Medicaid program pay for that. It would be cheaper for Medicaid to fix these people's houses than to keep paying for the medical costs of them going to the hospital and to the doctor over and over again. But that's not what Medicaid pays for right now. Medicaid will pay every time that kid is seen by a provider, but it's not going to pay, or it's currently not paying much less money to fix his home and improve his health. Um, this lady is uh, named Ms. E, and she is a, a, a patient within the Patient Care Innovation Center. This is a center that deals with the high cost, high need patients. And this next slide shows you what was going on in her life both before and after the intervention. What PCIC does is basically wrap somebody with intensive case management and make sure they get the social services that they need and all of the other things they need. And that keeps them out of the hospital, out of the emergency room. It keeps them out of jail because a lot of these people bounce in and out of jails as well. And it saves money, and it also improves the quality of life of the person. 
these are no-brainers and they can happen, but we've got to incense the people with the health care dollars to do this or they won't do it. Um, so here's the challenge we have. We have these cognitive biases that healthcare is the it. We love science and technology in this country. Um, and we also have a historical investment in the status quo. I mean, from the mid-1900s, we were saying to ourselves and to those who own hospitals, go build hospitals. We need all of this technology. We need this really um, expensive, very um, advanced stuff. And so we've told ourselves that for a really long time. And now the data's in. It's really clear. And we're going, oops, uh-oh, uh, cost too much, doesn't deliver enough. How can we do that? And I would suggest that we would start with the outcomes that we want to see and that we would go from there and decide what to use the money on so that you got those outcomes. If your outcome is to replace a knee, you think about it differently than if your outcome is to help a person be able to walk around the block. You may end up in the same place, but it's a different question if you ask yourself about the quality of that person's life. And so if you think about healthcare as just one tool and you have available to you many other tools for the same money, I think you can get a much better outcome if your outcome is the patient's health and quality of life. Um, I'm going to wrap up now and, and take questions. Let me leave you with just a few points that if you take anything away from here, I hope this is what it'll be. Um, we are spending almost all of our investment in health on health care, which is accountable for only 20% of health outcomes. We ought to be reallocating some of that money. We can do that through the healthcare delivery system. We just have to tell them that that's what we want them to use the money on. They are doing what they are paid to do. Everybody does what they're paid to do. We need to change the conversation because we can pay them to do the upstream kind of preventive work. We're not getting value paying for what we're getting today. We all have a hand in this. We're all payers. You're a payer if you're a taxpayer. You are a payer if you are an employer and you are paying for your employees to have health insurance. If you're buying your own health insurance, you're paying for this. And so you can say, I want to pay for health. I don't just want to pay for medical services. And if we can move the conversation in that direction and incent and reward and thank the healthcare industry for delivering health, that'll get us somewhere and that'll get us value.